Martin Luther would box the ears of any Protestant who claimed that evangelicals and Catholics are together because we're anything but, yeah, we share some commonalities like the Trinity, heaven, hell, some of the theological basics, but there is a vast chasm between evangelicals and Catholics, the papacy, Mariology, Soteriology, Bibliology, Poigatory, and the list goes on. The question that many of us have asked is, when did this happen? When exactly did the Catholic Church start getting all wonky? After all, that's why we had that little old Protestant Reformation. Let's jump into our DeLorean and take a look back in time. Uh, The very early years of the church, not the Roman Catholic Church, it didn't become that till the Bishop of Rome amassed a whole lot of power. But in the first few centuries, Basically, we were banging out orthodoxy. And please note, not every church father that you read is worthy of your respect because not all were actually orthodox. But it wasn't until, give or take, 4th century that the church started teetering over the edge of orthodoxy. And the Roman Catholic Church has been zooming down that slippery slope of heresy ever since. Number one. Prayers for the dead. They can't actually hear a word from us. Started, give or take, 300 A.D. Veneration of dead saints, the 370s. Mass, daily re-sacrificing of Jesus Christ on the cross. That was about late 300s. Marian dogmas, early, mid-400s, referring to Mary as Theotokos, which is right because she is the mother of God, but many intended that to elevate her to divine-like status. That's a big no-no. And so is the doctrine of purgatory, which totally undermines the redemptive work of Jesus, where you go to some netherland to pay for your own sins, about the late 500s. Prayers to Mary, give or take 600. Worship of images and relics, late 700s. Do you see the progression? Canonization of saints, late 900s. The celibacy of priests, wow. I guess a lot of priests were sinning for centuries. It's found nowhere in Scripture, which has led to an avalanche of sexual perversion among priests throughout history. That was the early thousands. Indulgences. Luther's pet peeve, late 1100s. The transubstantiation of the elements of bread and wine where a priest calls down Jesus from heaven, somehow mystically, bibbidi-bobbidi-boo-like, the bread and the wine actually become the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ, re-sacrificing him on the altar. That was 1215, and we now see a little bit of a respite of bad teachings being enshrined in the Roman Catholic Church until the 16th century. It was the Roman Catholic Council of Trent. It ran for a number of years, starting in 1545. They were the counter-reformation. They had to do something about all of these reformers who have exposed the Catholic Church. So what did they conclude at the Council of Trent? Well, they needed some more books. (laughs) They had to find their false teaching someplace. So they said, hey, Let's incorporate the Apocrypha. Protestants did not take books out of the Bible. The Roman Catholic Church injected new books into the Bible. Later, in 1854, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, that was made doctrine, meaning Mary was not imbued with original sin like, you know, every other human being ever But she was immaculately conceived and born free of sin. The thinking behind it is that, well, since Mary birthed Jesus, she had to be free of sin. But if Mary had to be free of sin, doesn't that mean that Mary's mother had to be free of sin? And if Mary's mother had to be born free of sin, doesn't that mean that her grandmother had to be born free of sin? And that is what we call an infinite regress. 1950. Hmm. Perhaps the culmination of all false teachings, the assumption of Mary into heaven. You know, the same way that Jesus ascended into heaven, despite the fact that he claimed that he was the only one to do that, the Catholic Church said, 
Mary to 1962. Don't care to stay there, but let's go there for a moment. This is when the Roman Catholic Church decided we got to drag ourselves into modernity. So what did they do? They called the Second Vatican Council, Vatican II, or if you speak Latin, that would be Vatican II. They ditched Latin from the liturgy. They started reading the Bible in English. On the one hand, that's not so good because now people could actually understand a lot of damning theology. On the other hand, now Roman Catholics could hear and learn in the Bible, in their own language, what we Protestants have known all along. We are saved by grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, revealed in Scripture alone. 1992, publication of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Have one of those when you're talking to a Roman Catholic who will say, don't, we don't believe in work salvation. You can bring them to the Roman Catholic Catechism. 1992, they said there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church and their official doctrine. Finally, one major note of heresy. Granted, this is not yet official Roman Catholic doctrine or dogma, but it's been gaining some serious ground, and it is seriously blasphemous. Mary is the co-redemptrix, so much for the glory of God alone, the co-mediatrix alongside of Jesus. Hold the phone, Henrietta. First Timothy 2 tells us there is one mediator between God and man, and it ain't Mary, and it ain't the Pope. There is only one Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. So now you might be scratching your head and wondering, hey, if the Roman Catholic Church got that wonky, were there any Christians? Remember, the Roman Catholic Church didn't become the Roman Catholic Church 400s at best, 500s perhaps. So you always had believers prior to the Catholic Church going off the rails, and you always had believers inside of the church. We see reformers throughout the Middle Ages who believed in grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone. We know that God was still building his church despite the building of the Roman Catholic Church. Not everyone was infected with unbiblical dogma. Not every Catholic believed every tenant, every false teaching of the church. Jesus has always had his sheep, even before Martin Luther nailed those complaints against a Catholic door in Wittenberg in 1517. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. And finally, and this time I finally, finally mean it, if you are a Roman Catholic who has been enduring this video, you might be a little hot under the collar. Please don't think that we hate you. It's a million miles from that. We do love you, and we would love to see the very heavy work-righteous yoke that the Catholic Church has laid on your shoulders replaced with the easy burden and light yoke of Christ Jesus. Please find yourself a church that teaches sola and tota, only and completely Scripture, and sit under a man who sits under Jesus. This preacher seems really good, but I don't want to be hoodwinked. I hope he's not a false teacher. Okay, false teacher, that was your cue. Hey, what's this? It's a wretched box. What's inside? It's the discernment bundle loaded with helpful tools so that you, your family, or your Sunday school class don't get hoodwinked. What is this? An expose drunk in the spirit on the new apostolic reformation movement, a conversation with Justin Peters, how to help a friend get out of a really bad system. You got yourself drive-by discernment, drive-by false teaching, hours of listening, and judge not, which is about about judging is what it's about. Why is this tape shut? You can get your own wretched box filled with discernment stuff, and we won't tape your book at wretched.org. Um, Houston, I think we have a few problems here. Go ahead, wretched one. Besides the fact I'm wearing a cardboard helmet, Houston, you have got one of the biggest false teachers 
<laughs> the universe. How rich is he, wretched one? <laughs> I can see his house from here.